If we could uh, begin the uh, conference committee. Uh, obviously, this, the speaker and the uh, pro tem will be joining us shortly. Uh, I'm Senator Flores, and I will, in their stead, begin the uh, conference committee. I would like to ask the uh, sergeants to please call uh, the members so they can uh, get to committee. We are dealing with probably one of the more important segments or discussions in this conference committee, and that is the financing. Uh, and I really want to and appreciate having the LAO here. Thank you very much. And why don't we begin, if we could, with uh, your uh, particular presentation. I will say uh, to frame uh, the issue for the committee members, uh, obviously uh, we have some big decisions as a committee to make, and probably the most important is how do we compare all these bond bills, uh, and ultimately uh, do we make a decision to make them one and as a conference committee, or do we begin to think about whether or not these bond uh, proposals are sufficient? Because as you know, most of the bond proposals are deal with the issuance of GO bonds only. Uh, there is no imposition of fees, and uh, we are the conference committee, the arbiter of that. And so I think it's important as we hear these bond proposals that we recognize that there, there may be some of us that have a split view of this, that there has to maybe a different balance. So I, I would uh, hope as we uh, begin to hear from Senator Simidian, Senator Cogdill, uh, and Assemblywoman Caballero that uh, we at some point have a discussion about how that process might work from a conference committee point of view. Uh, so let's go and begin. And we want to thank the LEO for being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Freeman. I'm with the Legislative Analyst Office. And uh, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about water financing, but I'd like to keep my comments paired to anticipate some questions. Um, we've given this presentation in uh, both the policy committees and some of the budget committees. And so uh, we want to open it up for some uh, discussion with the, the membership if they, um, if they so choose. That said, we're going to focus on a couple of issues. Um, how to choose a financing mechanism for um, the different types of uh, water financing, the infrastructure that you're looking at. Also, uh, where we're at on bonds, um, both the LEO recommendations and uh, how much we have left from the existing bonds. And then lastly, we want to, um, Jason Dickerson of our office is here to help with debt service. It's been a question that's come up several times, and we want to um, be available to you to help answer some of those questions before you go into the, the weekend deliberations. Um, so again, stop me, ask questions, and I'm going to try to keep this pretty high level. Um, so first of all, when we look at um, water financing, um, there really are some choices for financing mechanisms. And we want to look at a basic financial approach, both do we want to, what's the source of funding, and how do we want to go about funding? So the financial approach could be pay as you go. So we did this with flood financing a while back. We, um, there was a general fund appropriation, and we paid as we went for certain flood projects, emergency flood projects. In doing so, we didn't incur any debt on those projects. Now later, a bond was passed, and we do have uh, bond financing for flood projects, but it was a part of a package of financing that the legislature approved. The second is a, what we call renting and leasing, and this is kind of a, a rare um, instance for the water world. It's not something that's necessarily considered widely, um, but it's used in, pri in the private sector um, when uh, there's a purchase of a, um, a, a property and um, the, there's a payback by a public agency or others. And again, we're, this isn't probably the most common form of financing, but it is an available tool. The third really is bond financing, and that's the most common tool that the, uh, the legislature has used and the public has used. And uh, this is, again, this is borrowing money that's going to be paid back by something. And the question is, by whom? Is it by the general fund, or is it by users or fees? And I'll give you a couple of examples so that you can use them um, as you deliberate. Um, we want to emphasize that um, our office really supports the idea of uh, beneficiary pays. So when you look at a package of financing, there is a portion of uh, water infrastructure or water projects that may be appropriately funded by the general fund, the general taxpayer. They benefit the, the state as a whole. There are other parts that the legislature may wish to attribute to a certain party, so those who benefit from the project. And I'll give the example of the state water project. State Water Project is largely financed by the contractors who receive water from the State Water Project. They are the beneficiaries of the project. They pay almost 94% of the costs of developing the water project. 
to, to us, this is a, a model that the legislature can use. Now, the federal government doesn't use this type of financing. They attribute a, a specific ratio to the Central Valley Project, and it's 85% for paid for by the contractors or the beneficiaries, and 15% is paid for by the General Treasury of the, sta of the United States. So there's different models out there, and it doesn't. There's no hard and fast rule, but there are two ways of uh, taking a look at this. Um, in terms of other beneficiary pays applications, um, in flood control projects, we also use beneficiary pays. The state, uh, the non-federal share of uh, costs for flood projects are paid by beneficiaries, both whether it's the state or whether it's locals. Uh, and in surface storage projects, uh, beneficiaries of surface storage projects are supposed to reimburse, reimburse the state for uh, the expenditures ex in, during the exploration of whether or not those surface storage projects were feasible, and that's um, under the CalFed um, program. In terms of the case study of the state water project, um, again, I said that about um, the funding to build a project is about $6.4 billion. That has uh, about 96, I think I said 94, 96 percent has been paid back by the state water project users. A portion of funding is um, paid by the General Treasury for recreation and those benefits that the state and in the, on the whole um, may gain, but the contracts are in place. Um, they can be amended and we can um, talk about how to work with that, um, but that's our grand example. What I'd like to turn to, though, is bonds, so the state's mechanism for financing. Um, we have certain recommendations for financing for water projects that really focus on bonds. What we'd like to do is ensure that bonds are used for capital purposes. In the past, bonds, not necessarily those written by the legislature, have gone for programs that don't have a long payoff period. Uh, program management or programs that have a short-term uh, of a short-term nature. What we're looking at are, are projects that benefit the state for 15, 20, and 30 years, something with a longer payoff, something with a capital infrastructure. Um, we also think that it's very important for the legislature to retain its authority to appropriate funds. So in terms of continuously appropriating funds, we think the legislature should be able to start, stop projects, and to monitor those projects, monitor the funding and the financing for projects. I think it's an important role for oversight for the legislature, and it's a continuing issue that, um, that comes up. Uh, in our opinion, relying less on bond funding would be a, a good um, way to go, um, especially constrained bonds. Um, as we go to uh, a more difficult budget situation, overall state budget, um, cash situation, pay as you go becomes more um, it, a much more interesting way of going about paying for infrastructure and capital. So for sure we don't have a great deal of cash on hand, but as we look forward to maybe a 5, 10, 30 year project period for the Delta, it may be appropriate for the state to look at setting aside financing on an ongoing basis as well as looking at bond funding, there may be issues that we need or projects that we need to fund right away. But for those projects that we can spread out over time, it does make sense to do pay-as-you-go financing. Now whether that's the beneficiaries paying for them or whether it's the general fund, the two are, are both about the same. I mean the beneficiaries can't come up with five billion dollars today, but they could perhaps over a period of time. and. By doing pay as you go, you don't have the debt service at the very end of the bond, which uh, is becoming a more important issue in our area. And then um, again, we would suggest that you apply beneficiary pays to bond financing. There's no rule that says that a general obligation bond has to be paid back by the general fund, and we've seen this with the state water project. So as we go forward with a bond, it's, it's appropriate to look at what, again, the general taxpayer benefits from, and then also what the um, what should be paid for by beneficiaries, and they can pay back those bonds. So I'll just quickly turn to um, what's left from the bonds that we've passed. Uh, from Proposition 1E, I'm going to just go through the, the basically the water bonds. There's not really much else that is um, relevant to this discussion. 
In terms of the bonds that have been issued um, from 1996 to present, and that's about um, 20 billion of the 23 billion that we've passed over the last 30 years, uh, we have about $900 million for water quality. Some of that's going to the Department of Public Health. Others are going to specific programs. Uh, water management, we have about $2.1 billion. Uh, that would be largely focused in the flood and integrated water management areas. Uh, we have some funding for CalFed, but very little, uh, $77 million, not much left. And then also for conservation, restoration, and land acquisition, about $400 million. So we're not talking about a lot of money left over that has a lot of discretion for the legislature uh, to appropriate, uh, but there's, there's money there. Um, I guess what we then turn to is, well, what happens if we pass a bond? And for that, um, Jason Dickerson can help us out with some of the issues around debt service. Senator Nielsen. I don't know if I'm working for this from the same document, but, but I do have one that says uh, resources related bond balances, uh, 96 to present by program analysis. The total comes up to around 4.2 billion, right. uh, that would including parks and recs and separate category water, which includes water quality management, conservation, restoration and acquisition, CalFed and air quality. Is that That's pretty much in the ballpark? Yes, that's what we're working off and of. And this would be money that could be factored into our deliberations now about a prospective bond for other things, that this is in process bonds that could be used for these constructive purposes related to where we want to go? These bonds, as they were passed, um, had specific parameters to them. So, for example, uh, I'll use water management. Uh, the, the expenditures for water management will have to go for the purposes that the bonds were passed. So, yeah. for flood management, for integrated regional water management. That said, there's portions of those that probably could be used for some of the purposes that you're discussing, but we'd have to do a little bit more work to figure out what, what pieces go to which. And there may not be the kinds of direct nexus that you're really looking for. So it may be that you're looking for a different package of, um, of projects that these bonds really funded. But we don't have to evaluate some of our prospective solutions or desires or vision just in the void of a prospective bond or assessment fees or whatever. That's correct. But that we can factor this in, that there's some in-process monies for such purposes carefully crafted and et cetera, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, thanks for your presentation. I was intrigued by your um, statement that a general obligation bond can also have a beneficiary pays uh, component to it mm -hmm. and recipients of money from a GEO bond could be required to uh, in some ways uh, make the state whole. Can you just be a little more specific about what mechanism you envision uh, to do sure. that? Yeah, I, let, me, let me ask if I could clarify uh, just a bit. I think the question uh, is probably something we all have. That is, you have mentioned the GO bond and some components about uh, fees being somehow part of that. I've, I've never heard of a GO bond where fee, I, I've heard of revenue bonds, as, mm -hmm. as, as, as Senator Pavley said, I, we have local user feedback revenue bonds, we have regulatory backed revenue bonds, and we also have the component of assessment backed revenue bonds, which are property based. So we have these three, uh, if you will, uh, items or three mechanisms of the revenue bond, and yet you mentioned the GEO bond is somehow having the same components. So maybe you can. Yeah, but you have three different revenue streams potentially, but they wouldn't be part of the GEO. Well, so the, the way to look at this yeah. is what's, there's two ways to look at it. One is, what's the state's fiscal exposure? So you have a general obligation bond that's passed. Right. Uh, the state, let's say it's a $10 billion bond. The state is on the hook for the $10 billion. Right. Now, how the state pays back that bond yeah. is not determined by it just being a general obligation bond. We have put the full faith and credit of the state behind the bond. Mm -hmm. Now, in the bond, we can have a payback mechanism, and that's what we did with the state water project. The full faith and credit of the, the state of California is, is backing the bond that created the state water project. However, the payback mechanism for that was revenues from the contractors. And so every year they would pay back into, essentially they would pay off the debt service and the principal. So we're, it's not only allowable, it's, it's a practice that the state has used before. Mm -hmm. 
it's not quite the same as a revenue bond, but it, it really is um, a way to sort of separate out. We can have the, the general obligation bond that covers all of the issues that you're interested in, mm -hmm. but then have the payback mechanisms be separate for different parts of the bond. Mm -hmm. Again, though, the fiscal exposure is there. The, the state is on the hook for the general obligation bond. Should we not collect those fees? I, I think I understand how that would work with a, a piece of infrastructure that was going to result in water sales, for example, and a, and a defined revenue stream. Um, have you given any thought to how it might work for some of the broader public benefit pieces that uh, tend to be in these bonds, like some of the ecosystem restoration uh, that needs to be done in the, the Delta? Well, unless that, that ecosystem restoration was mitigation for the state water project or for another beneficiary group, there really does need to be a direct nexus between the fee payer and what they're paying for. So all of those rules still apply. So if, if for example, there's a, a part of the bond that generally benefits the entire state, uh, a, a beneficiary, the beneficiaries are the, the entire state. So the general treasury would, would pay it back. or if the state wishes to create an assessment on the entire state, um, a public goods charts have been mentioned, that type of tax could pay it back. But if you're a beneficiary and you're paying fees, it, there does need to be a direct nexus between what you're paying for and, and how you're paying. Mm -hmm. and, and, but does that get a little sloppy when we, we begin to uh, utilize the geo exposure. I mean, that's going to be an issue for the conference committee, this, the issue of size. And the issue of size is only of importance because of its relationship to what the exposure. And exposure is relationship in terms of ultimately how much the state would be on the hook for. If you take a pure revenue bond approach to this, then we're not going to be sizing something uh, that would be, in essence, uh, the state's general fund would be on the hook for. Is that Correct, correct view? If we took a look at a revenue bond, mm -hmm. if, the, if you give the, say, you know, in these bonds, and I'll, I'll just be yeah. explicit, that in the bonds there have been discussions about um, building conveyance structures. And those conveyance structures, folks have said that they want to pay for them. Well, there's no reason that within the construct of a bond you can't say that we're going to give X, Y, or Z the authority to issue a revenue bond and that's going to be paid back by the fee payers. That can be done. We can also do a general obligation bond and say the fee, we're going to have fees that pay a portion of the bond back. And again, this nexus issue is important. So we can't really have you know, all of the, the entire state paying for something that really only benefits 5% or 10% of the state. But for that 5 or 10%, the legislature may wish to attribute a certain portion to them. It may not wish to attribute the entire portion of the cost to them. It's, it's within your purview to decide that. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, in terms of language, there is language that we can look at from uh, the original state water project bond uh, that can maybe mm -hmm. help with uh, the discussion as it goes forward. Mm -hmm. Senator Pavley. Um, during our tenure, collective tenure here, we haven't looked at this kind of option. So thinking about the conveyance system and delta restoration, um, if there's a conveyance system, the exporters be willing to do the hard, the cost for the plumbing and infrastructure. Going back to uh, some member Huffman's thing on ecosystem restoration, setting that up under a revenue bond status or through a beneficiary pay, it operates somewhat like an assessment district where it ha the benefit has to come from people paying the assessment. And how you define who benefits from an ecosystem restoration in the Delta. More difficult. Uh, more difficult. More difficult, I would say. Or levy repair, more difficult, even more difficult. though there is a nexus on if levies crumbling, then the exporting of water does not mm -hmm. benefit Correct. anyone who's a beneficiary of the exporting of water. Depending on how the, uh, you know, when, once the conveyance structure is in place, the beneficiaries change. Um, the legislature probably should set parameters for how it wishes to treat levies in the Delta and, who, and set who the beneficiaries are. Right now, the beneficiaries are both the landowners that are within those islands, whether the levy, they can afford the levies or not, 
but also the exporters, and to some extent, other folks that are um, overall benefiting okay. from the Delta. That one's a le little place. easier to define on okay. who the beneficiaries are, so we get back to the ecosystem and the environment. It's possible then to have multiple approaches to paying off the front up costs of a bond for mm -hmm. that would include both facets of of um, water delivery as well as ecosystem restoration. That's correct. And having a port, I mean, I would just say having a portfolio approach to paying back any of the expenditures, and whether it's a bond or whether it's just a group of expenditures <coughs> that we're going to consider as part of the delta. Having a portfolio approach to paying them back um, does seem to make sense, given the, the complicated nature of, of the delta and the likely complicated nature of the fix to the delta. And these all have to be capital costs, not, or can they be ongoing expenditures? There's, there's two ways of looking at it. For bonds, we would suggest that bonds only be used for capital costs. Mm -hmm. However, there's nothing that says that ratepayers or whoever you determine to be the fee payer shouldn't be able to pay ongoing costs for programs. Oh, and and those probably shouldn't be paid through a bond. Final question. Yes. Could you articulate for me um, a public goods charge on water? I know how it, how it affects rate payers through the um, um, investor-owned utilities, because I have that on my Edison bill every, every month. Is that the same concept? Uh, the difference between energy and water, as we've been uh, learning in our offices, is uh, that there's 8,000 water utilities, and there's less than 100 electricity utilities. So putting a public goods charge on 8,000 water utilities could be um, somewhat difficult, not impossible. Anything can be done. Uh, in terms of a public goods charge, there's a bunch of different ways. There's several different ways that we've looked at to uh, create a public goods charge. And I might even say a bunch. There's just a, a lot of ideas. You could uh, charge for every um, water hookup, everyone who has a meter. Well, but that excludes some folks who don't have meters or who, who pull groundwater. Mm -hmm. um, every diversion off of a stream. There's just a, a lot of ways of looking at a public goods charge. And in, in our minds, we haven't really seen one that, that captures it entirely. And again, even with the public goods charge, we, though it is a tax, seeing some sort of nexus between what, who's paying for that public goods charge and what they're getting from it still seems to make sense. I mean, we want to make uh, some No, I just connection. wondered if that was sort of a beneficiary pays kind of a approach. In general, they're, they're taxes. Okay. So All right. they are considered Got it. Mr. Better. Jeffries, you. Could, could you tell me what the nexus is for every single water provider or every single water consumer in the state to pay a public goods charge. I mean, you already have the AB 32 scoping plan that wants $500 million from everybody through, mm -hmm. through a public service goods charge. I mean, there's only so much money to go around, and if, if those local agencies have to, you know, to do improvements in their districts to become less dependent on the Delta, mm -hmm. and yet turn around and ship money up to the state to redistribute to other projects, I mean, What's the nexus for some of those districts and consumers? Uh, it, in, in that case, that's something maybe to ask the administration. We don't recommend at this time a public goods charge. We don't recommend against it either. Um, we really would look to, again, this portfolio approach where you look at a beneficiary pays, those who have direct benefits, look to the general public. If the general public benefits, then perhaps they should be paying in. And then if there's any other way of, uh, of attributing costs, say, um, for those who will, are willing to pay for projects, that's also another way of looking at it. But we haven't uh, explored a recommendation on the public goods charge. And in, in, if I may, Mr. Chair, follow up. I mean, those that are paying, how do they know that it's going to projects that are beneficial to their districts? And I mean, who, who would and I recognize you're not advocating, I'm just trying to work through this. This large sum of money is shipped up to Sacramento because you have a water meter in El Cajon. And it goes into this pot of money someplace in, controlled by somebody. I mean, what is it going to do to benefit them? And I'm just picking El Cajon out of the blue, but okay. <clears throat> they're at the end of the pipeline, so. 
they're as good as any, especially in terms of the state water project. We've had this problem uh, for quite a while, and uh, the state water project's off budget. Uh, our office has been looking into the issue of bringing them on budget for uh, several years, and we've uh, been uh, somewhat frustrated at times with the information that we've received on what the state water project, so the contractors, say those who pay in from Southern California into the state water project, both what they're getting for their dollar and what the legislative oversight is. Because truly, the, the folks who are going to be monitoring the dollars are the legislature. The administration will, the Department of Finance will, and then uh, the legislature ultimately will be the ones who can say, no, we, we need to stop what we're doing or we need to go back. And so having a um, billion dollar annual budget for water off budget, which means that the legislature doesn't appropriate the funding, has been um, somewhat difficult as we move forward with these discussions. So we would concur that it's um, oversight is extremely important as we start discussing funds, fees, or general taxpayer dollars going for any project for a Delta fix. Okay, Senator Cogdell. Thank you very much. Can you give us some insights as to uh, the original uh, project that Governor Brown uh, initiated and saw through to fruition, uh, how the financing mechanisms worked for that. I understand there was a construction commission that was uh, charged with moving forward and building the projects. And was there continuing appropriation at that time? Uh, yes, there was an appropriation that was, I'd have to actually go back and check some um, details, but uh, the contractors uh, have been paying into what has been in practice a continuing appropriation to the Department of Water Resources. Now um, that continuous appropriation can be shifted as we've found out um, through our legislative council. We can have uh, those dollars, the state water project dollars run through the state budget. However, um, up until now, so for a practice of about 40, 45 years, the dollars have essentially been continuously appropriated or off budget. The, the impetus of that and the commission's role in the development of the financing mechanism and the contracts, I'm not quite sure I could explain articulately. Okay, but the point being, the money was continuing, continuously appropriated. Correct. And there hasn't been any additional uh, legislative uh, involvement as it relates to appropriating money to those projects. That's correct. The only other appropriations that have happened have been directly related to recreation or to ancillary projects or to the CalFed program. Uh, there may have been others, but the body of, of what we're talking about is exactly what you said. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from members on this? Let me, uh, I think we're going to transition, correct, to yeah. the amount uh, outstanding. Is that is that what we're... We're going to talk a little bit about debt financing and, and try to answer some of the questions that we've received uh, from you folks. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, Jason Dickerson from the Legislative Analyst Office. In general, for every billion dollars of new bond authorization, you should expect that the state would have repayment obligations of roughly $65 million a year each year for 30 years. That's a general principle, market conditions at the time the bonds uh, are sold and, and any uh, unusual details of, of, of the bonds uh, could make that vary. The budgetary situation that the state faces, as you well know, is quite serious. Um, in November, our office will update our, re our estimates of state general fund revenues and expenditures. But just as the administration has forecast that uh, the state general fund will face uh, structural deficits for the foreseeable future, we are likely to find that the general fund will face for, uh, deficits for the foreseeable future. And so that means that as you explore uh, water financing options, uh, you need to think very seriously about the, the, the financial uh, obligations that would go to the general fund. Um, because there is a, a structural deficit to be forecast for the foreseeable future, it means that th there is no more capacity in the general fund at this time to fund really any additional cost unless a revenue source is established either to pay it to the general fund or outside the general fund 
or you make decisions to reduce the general fund's baseline spending requirements. So that's the, the, the situation that you face, and I think that the, the state's general fiscal situation um, is really is what, what, what's of interest to bond investors and rating agencies. There is no hard and fast rule of thumb for how much debt the state can have at any one time. Uh, investors and rating agencies have not been criticizing the, the, the state of California for the amount of debt it has outstanding. What they have been troubled by and what has complicated uh, our financing efforts in the last year in particular has been the state's fiscal, the budgetary and cash situation. And so I think that investors and rating agencies will be looking carefully uh, if, if you proceed down the road of a bond issue to see what effect will that have on the general fund. And in particular, I think they'll be interested to see uh, that you're able to mitigate substantially or entirely the future exposure of the general fund to the, the cost of any new bond issue. Members, any uh, comments, discussion? So you're telling us nothing prohibits us from going to the market. Uh, as it's the cost of the bond, this is what we're talking about. The, correct? The, the, the bond market has, uh, has been uh, quite willing to lend the state money, although sometimes at a higher interest right. rate. So it's a matter of cost, correct? It's a matter of cost, and, uh, and what the market has been troubled by is the state's difficulty with budgetary balance and cash. And so what they're likely to ask if the state proceeds down the road of a new bond authorization for water, a substantial one is, mm -hmm. what effect will this have on the general fund in the future? Okay. Senator Pavley. If anyone has questions on the bonds, I don't want to interrupt. I was sort of going on that say, several category of those different pots of money. Is this appropriate to ask? Um, on water quality, I do remember as former chair of budget sub three in the assembly, uh, I think uh, the Department of Public Health that was inability to get out regulations that made it easy for local governments to provide matching funds for, if I'm, I'm remembering that correctly, and would, I guess, what is the impediment for why that money hasn't gone out the door? And I, I can't remember if it's Prop 13 dollars or 50 dollars. And if you had to refine that to some extent, does that mean putting it back in the bond to uh, change the wording to facilitate getting that money out the door. I remember there was some problem that made it unattractive, whether it was a matching compliance or something. There, there are a certain number of pots. There's sort of two questions. What do we do? Can we amend another uh, previous bonds uh, with the new bond? Yes. You so can. we put in language the in the new bond to fix the old. Correct. Uh, what you're speaking of, uh, as I remember, was a dis uh, there were a couple of pots, one of which happened to be uh, loans to farmers. Uh, and they, they were not interested in the loans because there were grants available or because there were requirements in the bond, in the, in the voter approved bond, that the farmers weren't interested in having imposed upon them by accepting the funding. So the pot sat there for quite a while. At this point in time, what's left in water quality is mostly Proposition 84 bond okay. funds, and there is a schedule for rollout over a four to five year period. So at this point, we're not really concerned that they're not getting the money out the door yet um, and haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about um, not getting the money out. That okay. said, every year we look at their, their budgets and try to make sure that they're staying on target because the voters did approve the bonds and the programs uh, okay. seemed to be important to them at the time. So it is getting rolled out the door through Department of Public Health. A portion, a portion of it through the NDWR. That's correct. CalFed, is that bond monies that are in there or is it general fund money, a combination of that? And what is that money being used for today and could that argumentatively be swept up to help fund the um, new stewardship council and ongoing expenses in the science panel. We can get you details. It's really only $77 million, and I, I shouldn't say only, because yes, $77 that million like is, is, a, is a significant amount of money. <laughs> uh, we can get you the pots that that specifically goes to. I don't have it with me. Um, and yes, it can be rolled into this discussion. It can get rolled into a solution. Um, any of these, including the integrated regional water management pots, can be rolled into a solution. Uh, finding a way to fit them together, the puzzle pieces together, may be somewhat challenging, 
but there's no reason that they can't be either crafted together or with in mind of each other. Are integrated regional management dollars mixed in with the CalFed monies? No, oh, we okay. separated those out. We okay. tried to pull CalFed separately. So the CalFed really hasn't been up and running for a couple of years other than perhaps a science panel meeting as needed. Could the um, administration be continuing to draw down that money that could be used for some other purpose? I haven't ever gotten a handle where that money is going or? We, uh, I think in the, in the budget process this year, there weren't a lot of CalFed projects that were pushed forward. Right. Um, there were, there was a lot of, uh, we had a couple of recommendations to halt certain projects. Um, some funding did go out for CalFed projects. Some of it was bond funding. Uh, and we can try and tie those numbers together um, and, and give you a sense of, of what is what is really left. What can we actually And, and could it be shifted? That's yeah. right. And so there, there is ongoing funding that could be attributed to CalFed. Mostly the language has changed to Delta-related projects. So instead of taking the moniker CalFed, the projects, including some of the integrated regional water management mm -hmm. pro programs, have more of a Delta discussion. So uh, it's a technical change on the budget proposals, but the effect is the same. The money is going into similar areas. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Look, can I follow up on a question Senator Pavley had just a moment ago? I think Senator Pavley might have been asking if she wasn't. Let me ask. You're saying that with all of our bond capacity we have currently within the water world, we can roll that up. We can refinance that into one or two bonds. Is that what you're saying? In other words, taking all of these extra dollars that might be lying out there? I think what we were talking about is for, for those older bonds, so we have bonds that go back 10, sure. 10 years. Right. Uh, there were certain pots that we just couldn't spend, and, and the dollar amount there yeah. really is small. I mean, we're talking between less than $50 million. Mm -hmm. And there were certain programs that just weren't successful. For those bond funds, it, it is possible to say, okay, well, we're going to change that program Right. Um, the legislature is able to change programs in yeah. bonds, but it um, it generally has to go back to the voters if there's going to be a significant change to the program. Yeah. So yes, we can make amendments. However, mm -hmm. it probably isn't going to be the mm -hmm. main focus of, of the discussion for the Delta. No, it isn't. But let me let me interrupt you and tell you why I think that's important. And, and that is one of the things this committee is going to have to decide. Uh, as we look at a financing approach, is that if you looked at uh, Prop 13, Prop 84, Prop 50, mm -hmm. we've got bond funds when, as we've allocated these water bonds all over the place, parks, DWR, I mean, they're, they're, they're scattered. And, and I think the, the, the real issue for the committee will be if we do roll up some of these outstanding bonds, uh, whether the committee sees the value and purpose of having some centralized place where we can actually some of, see some of these bond funds being dispersed. I know that's the major question of the day when it comes to governance um, mm -hmm. and where that lies. And, and, but I do, you see that as a possibility of rolling up all of these existing funds and somehow, in essence, putting them in some sort of a order that allows us to, in essence, take a very uncoordinated way that we currently do this today in state government and, and make it a more efficient. Is that, do you see that as a possibility? I'm not sure that there would be efficiency necessarily to be gained mm -hmm. by, by going back to the bond, those original bonds. Um, then why do we have, still have so many funds outstanding well, sitting in it, accounts? If it's sufficient, it would be gone, would be my guess. Well, I think uh, the mm -hmm. largest amount that we have is, again, from Prop 13, and it was Proposition 13, yeah. and it was a specific program. So, so I'm not saying that there's not a possibility, yeah. nor is it um, outside the realm of the purview Maybe of the it is. folks Senator here. Copley. It is more like the Prop 13, because Prop 50, I remember, yeah. 84, excuse me, I remember that purposely the bonds would be sold slowly and we wouldn't be doing a bond every other year, but stretched out over multiple years. So when she said the yeah. Prop 50 dollars, or 84 dollars are actually assigned to programs going out every year, right. that was I understand. The intent. I, and, and I guess I'm trying to push you to, to, uh, to give us some thought That's process on, on a debate mm -hmm. on, the, on the conference committee, which is... Uh, you know, placing this responsibility with a new council or, in essence, reconfiguring our water commission, but trying to find some centralized way mm -hmm. uh, to, to put out water funds without, as we have in past bonds, specifically giving statutory requirements to various aspects of government, which I think and sometimes leads to 
uh, some inefficiencies and some and many times having additional funds outstanding and so that's that's an issue that the conference committee will have to debate as you know we do uh, we will have that will be part and par parcel of the uh, the state direction but I, I'm just trying to push it on that for a bit let me ask one more question and I, I'm, I don't want me to monopolize members but you mentioned the uh, issue at the very beginning of your presentation about staggered you didn't say the word staggered but you kind of were was heading to uh, pay as you go and as you get to bonds long-term uh, financing you know in this particular debate here uh, on this conference committee we have uh, conveyance and we have associated mitigation uh, the next layer we have is environmental restoration and surface storage and the next uh, is community investment and then we have a whole host of watershed uh, conserving uh, issues and recycling we have a whole tier of things that on mass looks like they're all in one bill but in many cases if you look at the way they could be funded, they could be funded in a, in a very staggered way. Uh, what do you think about that? What would be the LAO's, and you mentioned earlier our bond capacity. What, what, what would be LAO's view of looking at some of these projects and, and in essence funding them, but funding them in a, in a more staggered manner? Well, first of all, it, the state doesn't have to take on all of the role of, of fixing the delta. That's, that's one thing that we should be maybe considering. So in terms of water conservation, we've been looking at this. We don't necessarily have strong recommendations at this point on, on how to finance. But in, in terms of how water conservation has been paid for over time, it really has been the locals doing most of the work. We've had some bonds here and there. We've given some incentives, some carrots. Uh, but the locals have taken the, the bulk of water conservation because it is generally a local issue. And uh, folks have the ratepayer funds to pay for these things. So that, that's, that's one thing to consider is, is in terms of staggering, we're not just staggering over time and over financing sources, but also over levels of government. Um, so, But for today's purposes, we're trying to figure out how to structure a bond, if, we're, if indeed we're heading in that direction and the right use of bonds and fees. Right. And so I guess my question would be, if you look, and this is just my view so members don't, you know, look at conveyance. One when I might say conveyance could be ready by uh, 2000. 19. Uh, the other uh, other folks could say that, uh, if you will, conservation efforts might be a little longer. Uh, storage might be out a little further. Uh, if we were in service with conveyance before storage and storage came before, uh, if you will, watershed protection it, in the in the staggering of trying to make that effective, does the LAO have a, pro a thought process of looking at various financing approaches, revenue bonds? GO bonds that would allow us to take to the voters tranches of, uh, if you will, decisions. We all did this, members, you might remember, with high-speed rail. We didn't vote for high-speed rail and then take a vote on it the next two years. We, we kind of put that out there two or four years, and we, in essence, timed the market to where the, it, it, the market was ready to do this. And, and in this case, where we're trying to minimize the cost to the general fund, uh, what would you suggest that we look at tranching some of this in terms of a staggered approach? Well, to be sure, the state can't afford. At this point in time, the, the question is affordability. Mm -hmm. What can the state afford? And so if, you're, if the purview of the committee is to put most of it onto a general fund, well, we do need to look at whether or not the state can afford that general fund. So the, the um, example of water conservation actually is important because you could start with water conservation if, if again, this is just an example. This isn't a, a priority of the LAO. This is just an example. But if you start with water conservation and have it continue to be paid for by locals, well, that, that is actually staggering the financing, and that is allowing something to go forward. So, for example, let's take conveyance, where uh, a, a user group, a, a fee-based group, a beneficiary group, has said that they are interested in paying for this conveyance structure, and they would like for revenue bonds to be made available to them. Uh, the, le the committee may wish to consider that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the state's fiscal exposure is getting necessarily greater. We're just giving them some, some more authority. I should not use the word exposure, but um, we have a dedicated stream to pay that back. So then you go to the general obligation bond. That's really the meat of where the difficulty of how are we going to stagger um, financing. So. It, get, it gets back to the basics. Do we, who are the fee payers going to be and for what projects? Once you've set that aside, then we get to general fund. And 
for the purposes of this discussion, it is the legislature that needs to make the decision as to how much, for example, for surface storage or for others, for other projects, is going to be paid for by the general fund. Mm -hmm. I would just offer as well that I, I think going to, to some of your question, uh, a great many of the investors who will invest uh, to the extent that bonds are a part of the solution, a great many of the investors are here in California, uh, and, and they certainly appreciate the complexity, I think, of, of the water issues uh, in the state. I don't think that, that investors, I don't think that rating agencies would be intimidated by an, uh, essentially a portfolio of financing mechanisms that might seem quite complicated. But I do think that investors do deplore uncertainty. And so to the extent that a significant bond is a part of your solution, I think that they might value having a substantial framework of that plan mm -hmm. when the bond is authorized. Even if it's something that materializes over the course of several years, it would help the treasurer and the administration as they go to market of that, that authorization of bonds to be able to describe the investors essentially the story. This is how we're going to get from point A today to point B 10, 15, 20 years from now. Here's how the bond, bonds will be used. Here's how we expect them to be paid back. So I do think that, that uh, the, the market certainly could understand a complex series of financing mechanisms, mm -hmm. but I think that they tend to favor, and this is something that the state of California and other states don't necessarily do so well all the time, they tend to favor a very coordinated long-term plan for infrastructure. And so to the extent that you can move in that direction, that would be something I think investors would look upon favorably. Okay. Senator Cogdell and Senator Huck. Thank you very much. Uh, you may have covered this and I missed it, but I, I know you did uh, let us know where we are right now as it relates to general obligation bonds that are mm -hmm. outstanding and what has been approved um, uh, but yet to be issued. And I'm wondering with what is out there that we are currently paying debt service on, do you have any figures available as to how much of that debt will be retired over the next five years, ten years, fifteen years, I don't, um, I don't have that ready, but we can, we can get that, uh, that to you. In general, the state has moved in recent years to paying off uh, its debt over a period of thirty years. Uh, that uh, level debt service, so essentially like most people's home mortgage, a sort of a level uh, annual payment. Um, Investors and rating agencies are comfortable with that. Uh, we, we can get you uh, the exact numbers. Looking at uh, debt service as a whole, not just in the, the water area. Yeah, well, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, when we, we talk about uh, trying to get this question before the voters, and if it's in November of 2010 or where, whenever they make the decision, and if it's affirmative to, to move forward, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, with the infrastructure we're talking about is not going to be built overnight, and there's still a whole series of studies and analyses that needs to be done before we get to even what I guess many of us would refer to as the permit stage where you're ready to go. So my point being that I think if this legislature and the people of the state uh, hold water in the priority that I think they should and they do, then it's a matter of us managing our debt in such a way as to reflect that priority uh, and, and maybe move water up in the queue, if you will, as it relates to what's already been approved. So I think to look at what's been approved and say we've got too much outstanding now, we can't consider anything else is a little bit short-sighted from that standpoint. We, a lot of that we haven't spent yet, and a lot of that needs to be, again, I think reprioritized based on whatever needs happen to, to be facing us. And again, I think water is probably at the top of that list. Um, so anyway, I think it would be helpful to mm -hmm. know that. I, I will uh, offer in case it's helpful, in 2009-10, for, for that portion of, of, of our bonds that are paid from the general fund, which is the bulk of them, geo and lease revenue bonds, the state will have probably a little north of $5.3 billion uh, of debt service in the current fiscal year. Uh, that's a little over 6% of the state's projected general fund revenues. Uh, under current bond authorizations, our debt service is projected to peak roughly about five or six years from now. In 2013-14, uh, the general fund, as I mentioned, $5.3 uh, $5 billion in 2009-10. In 2013-14, the general fund, with the current bond authorizations and their current expected rate of issuance, can be expected to have a GEO and lease revenue bond debt service of about $8.7 billion, which could be 
in the neighborhood of 9% of revenues at that time. The legislature, through its powers of appropriation, does have the power to prioritize, to some extent, which bond projects have a priority, and even, to some extent, how fast those are issued. Now, when I say in 2013-14 we expect to have debt service of around $8.7 billion, a lot of that additional issuance between now and then essentially has already been obligated. There are already projects that are beginning to be built, that are beginning, that are in design and so forth. And so you do have the power to some extent, as you said, to influence which projects come first, how fast bonds are issued, uh, but, but that is a, a power that that uh, you and future legislatures would need to use very cautiously during the budget process to make that work. Right. And I certainly agree with your, your comments relating to a dedicated, uh, you know, a dedicated amount out of the budget every year for infrastructure. That's something that a lot of us have talked about and pushed for for a long time. But you know the difficulties with that is, and that's you build a fund if you don't have some way to to ironclad it and make sure that when we go through tough times like we're going through now that it doesn't get raided, that's the real trick. And I don't think anybody's been able to figure that out, and that's why one of the major reasons why we don't have that fund available. So another thing I think Governor Brown, to his credit, uh, had available to him to operate from, which was an ongoing um, capital improvement fund, if you will, that was funded every year as part of the general fund. One other quick question. On the, the propositions that were mentioned, I think it was... Uh, 13, 12, 84, whatever they are. 15, okay, 1584. Um, when we talk about potentially looking at those and reallocating uh, the monies, on those particular ones, um, is it a situation where we have some latitude there, or would you have to go back to the people uh, with a proposal that would alter those allocations? I think to the extent that um, we've been able to uh, modify the programs to make uh, to be more useful to the users, that's happened. So what's left, and again, this is the older bonds, not Proposition 84, uh, it would have to go back to the people. Um, and, and I may be wrong on, on some of the minor um, programs, but there are really some ones that stick out that, that folks just, it, they just didn't work for whom they were designed for. And so we'd have to redesign them. The other option is to uh, sort of drop the programs entirely and to do something new. I, um, so again, again those, as it goes back to relates to the overall debt that's yeah. out there based on your projections uh, and those bonds, that could be reduced as a result of that if the decisions were made by the legislature that the programs are no longer viable or should be continue to we should proceed with them? It's a tough call to say a, a voter approved program is no longer viable but if over a period of time that money is never spent um, it, the, and the bonds are not sold um, we're sort of at a wash. Is there a time frame on that in the law? Um, I can't remember what the time frame is. Do you know the time frame? For, I, I think it's in the individual bonds. I, I'm sorry. I think it's in the individual Right. In, in some cases there is no time limit. Uh, Senator Huff, before that, are you telling Senator Cogdell that we can't statutorily change at least the functions of some of these programs when it comes to the expenditure of bond funds? I believe that you have to hit a two-thirds uh, majority vote, but that the substant there's a, a legislative council decision that you have to, or there's a trigger that you have to hit for um, determining. Oh, good. Well, I've got a lawyer here. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, Mark Newton with the LAO. Uh, we've spent a fair bit of time with Ledge Council on this very issue of just what is the legislature's authority to pass statute to, to perhaps change sort of uh, voter approved bond measures. And your authority really is to, to pass implementing legislation that simply furthers the purpose of the, the bond provision. But uh, it, it's a pretty narrow set of circumstances that you can, can, can do that. You can't change the, the use of, of funds, for instance. Uh, uh, and Ledge Council has, has been fairly conservative in their, in their view, and it, it wouldn't take much of a change to have to go back to the, uh, back to the voters. Mm -hmm. uh, I perhaps just wanted to, to add to, to my colleague's comment on the, sort of the, the programs that aren't, aren't, aren't working. And I think those, from our review, I, I think those are probably a, a fairly limited number of, of pots, and the the provision that uh, my colleague Catherine Freeman mentioned about uh, 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 funding for farmers, that was actually Proposition 204, which is a 1996 
bond measure, and there was funding, both loans and grants, for agricultural water quality. And, uh, and it was the loan aspect. There just wasn't a, a demand that wasn't seen as a significant enough in incentive. Uh, uh, and that, uh, um, uh, much of that funding remains. But if the legislature wanted to use those funds for another purpose, uh, you clearly have to go back to, to the voters. There, there's no question on that. Okay. Great. Senator Huff. Thank you. And that's on the point of what I wanted to clarify a little bit. Um, it, if I understand properly, Prop 84 is the biggest pile of money that we have left on these bonds, and that's going to, on the natural, be allocated over the next four or five years. Is that correct? Is that what you said, that's right. Ms. Freeman? Okay. It, it seems incumbent on us as we're looking at this overall policy to do that repackaging of the existing stuff. And I think we should also be looking at Prop 84 to make sure it still makes sense. Because when you get down to it, those bonds are all crafted as a Christmas tree with ornaments hung on there for different groups to get the necessary votes to make it pass. That didn't mean it was good policy. That meant it was what would get it passed through the voters. Now that we're looking back from this with 2020 hindsight, and we can see what has been used, what hasn't been used, and maybe even some that's still there to be used that probably would be used, but it's not the highest priority where we are now, I think we should be looking at repackaging this money for what makes the most sense. Uh, clearly, just to run it out because we have it is, is like, you know, <laughs> somebody without any money to pay the house mortgage, but they've got five bucks in their pockets, so they're going to go out and, you know, spend it on some booze. Um, so I, I do think we should be looking at reallocating that, even if it is going back to the voters as a repackaged priority list. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just, well, I'm getting a question. Well, it's wrong to spend that $5, and if we've been sitting here in committee long enough, maybe not. We'll change my perspective. But anyway, that was my comment. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Cogdill did ask a question I wanted to answer about and the rate we'll at which. And have Assemblywoman Fuller. Uh, uh, the rate at which our general obligation bonds are being retired, our largest category of those are fixed rate general obligation bonds. We have $54.6 billion outstanding. That's all issues. We repay about $9 billion of those in the next five years, $17 billion in 10 years, $25 billion in 15 years, so roughly half of them retired within 15 years. So you're saying we can replace that $9 billion with something in the next couple of years? We are already expecting to do that as a result of the 2006 bond authorization. So, gotcha. uh, so essentially, with our debt service rising, uh, mm -hmm. the, the current plan with the existing bond authorization for schools, mm -hmm. for resources, and for other projects is that we will, I would expect, be issuing more than we would be retiring already over the next five years, be, unless you take action to change mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And that would be a decision of the Treasurer, though, in, a, in essence, to continue to add to that additional net the legislature, through the power of appropriation, uh, determines to a large extent uh, which projects go forward and therefore which ones require bond financing. So you do have the ability to influence that. Mm -hmm. but there, are, there are some bond authorizations that are more on autopilot that you don't have as much authority to, uh, to, uh, to look at. But, but in general, you have substantial authority if you choose to use it through your appropriation power to, to influence that process. Burke, on this point, yeah, on this point. Senator Cogdill, and then Senator um, Fuller. Just to follow up on that, I just wondered how does the continuing appropriation issue uh, impact that? Because obviously now we've taken it out of the hands of the legislature relating to prioritizing expenditures, and we've authorized the Construction Commission theoretically to go forth and build. Um, so how do they fit into that? In terms of the Construction Commission, uh, in terms of uh, I'm going to look at the state water project as an example. The legislature still has the authority, if it sees a need to, to run continuous appropriations through the budget. Now, in terms of the state water project, there's some caveats, huge caveats to that. You can't really go against the contracts that we've signed with the contractors. Right. However, there's nothing that says if the legislature sees a problem, it can't stop something. And one of the ways to do that is to take a continuous appropriation and put it into the budget process and have folks come in and go through the regular process. Uh, however, if there's no problem, we have a significant amount of revenue bonds and other types of financing that are continuously appropriated that don't run into problems. And so uh, being selective with, with, our, with our time and, and efforts um, can be a prudent way to go. In terms of future bonds, we still recommend that the legislature retain as much oversight as possible. And one of the ways to do that is to uh, run appropriations through the budget. 
um, but there has been um, some discussion about um, continuous appropriation as well. Right. Good. Thank you. Assembly Woman Fuller. It seems to me that since water is one of the most important things we can do for our state and is absolutely critical for human life, we need to have a stable funding mechanism that isn't influenced by the trends and in the inexperience of the legislature and people coming and going. And um, I think one of the first things we need to do is we need to first repackage like in most, in most organizations, you sweep all those nickels and dimes that are left at the end of the year that you didn't spend because of whatever reason. You need to sweep that back and put that as a debt reduction out there so the public can see. First, we reduced our past expenditures, and now we're moving on to using that credit that's freed up, so to speak, in a better way with some type of bond. And... <clears throat> And then we need to have a diverse portfolio. Um, we all know that that's better because you don't know what the conditions are going to be. So keeping the state water contractors off budget allows for the conveyance system to be paid for and moved out in one part of the portfolio. It allows for some kind of general geo bond to be smaller because we've reduced and swept the old money back in. So in term, and we, we make that in some continuous fashion because um, those are capital projects and you can't stop in the middle conveniently. And third and lastly, we need to separate into different pots ongoing money from one-time money. And because that really, if you, if you, don't, if you don't differentiate between those two, that's, that's the killer between the revenue and the bond money, which is sort of a finite situation. So in looking at our packaging, that's what I'm going to be looking for, uh, is that kind of package that allows me to see that there is a stabilized, diverse portfolio that distinctly separates one-time funding from ongoing funding. So at the end of the day, when we get to that part, if you rec can recommend some of those ideas so that we see how that works, I, I really appreciate it. I know that's where you're trying to get, but at the end, how does that package together and come back with the nexus that we need to have in order to do all the things we need to do? Mm -hmm. And I, I would just actually like to address what um, Senator Cogdell said earlier. Uh, who administers those funds? Funds are going to come into the state, so state water project funds. Who administers those funds is very important, and who oversees those funds is very important. The example of the State Water Project, the problem that we're seeing is that new projects are being proposed for the State Water Project that the contractors don't seem to want, the uh, legislature may wish or not wish for to occur, and yet they're being funded by a significant amount of ratepayer funding that's going into the Department of Water Resources, who is the sole arbiter of that funding. They are the arbiter. So the question is, and I, I agree that there, there are funds, again, revenue bonds and others that um, can go continuously appropriated, but being cognizant of who is going to be overseeing funding, not necessarily, and, and who's going to administer the funding, I think is just an important cautionary tale. Uh, whether it's a commission overseeing or whether it's a public body, uh, those are all options available. Um, but we want to be careful that dollars in, whether they're general fund or fee payer funds, are watched. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, members, if I just may add to, to Catherine's comments and, and add to, to Assemblymember Fuller's uh, comments that certainly a, a dedicated, stable source of funding to address Delta issues is, is, is crucial. And a few LAO recommendations we've made in the past that relate to that, that just to inform the committee. One is, I think, the importance of having a long-term financing plan for the Delta. And I think one of the major um, impediments to CalFed being a great success is that there, in the nine years of CalFed's existence, there's not been an operational long-term financing plan. And, and without that, uh, you have a program that really operated without a sense of, of priorities. 
And so if you have a financing plan, what it, what's automatically connected with that is, is what are your funding priorities to address the issue, and, and it gives the program a fair bit more, more direction. But another LEO recommendation we've made in the past uh, for CalFed, and this would apply as the legislature is looking more broadly at Delta issues, is, is the role for, for meaningful performance measures. We've spent almost $3 billion of state funds on the CalFed program, and uh, many members have asked a, a lot of good questions of what have, what have been the outcomes from that? I mean, has water quality improved? Uh, uh, what, what did we get for the $3 billion investment? And the concept of perform performance measures really hasn't uh, been part of that program, and we think they can, if well-crafted, can play a, a very important role. And our recommendation would be that any measures that are developed be developed sort of with the legislature sign off to reflect what the legislature considers important to measure, but also tie to the budget process so that whenever a budget proposal is presented to the legislature at, at budget hearings to do something related to the Delta, um, we would expect, we would require the administration to, to articulate how that budget proposal affects a particular performance measure that the legislature feels is important. So uh, we, uh, it, it's a recommendation, uh, sort of long standing of our office that meaningful performance measures be developed uh, in the context of addressing uh, Delta issues. Right. Senator Anastad. I, I wasn't going to say anything until you spoke, sir. Four times you mentioned the word Delta. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Assemblyman Fuller, but I, th I think your remarks were not limited to the very small area of the Delta, but you were talking more of a global water funding plan for the entire state project or the state the state issue, north, south, central, and delta. Am I not correct? So let's not make the mistake here that we're now just concerned with the delta and, uh, and I didn't want you to make your assumptions based on oh. just that very small local oh, area. Very important point, Senator, and uh, I guess I was just speaking from the CalFed experience, the Delta experience, but certainly the, that, uh, the experience with not having a financing plan and not having performance measures is very relevant as the legislature looks at water issues statewide, so it's a statewide application. Right. Senator Nelson. Well, let me see if I could kind of summarize in my mind. Uh, I feel very strongly about the need for a continuous appropriation for a whole lot of reasons. But could we not then inculcate in this the, some of the accountability that an annual appropriation would do so, but avoid the machinations of, and vicissitudes of the budget process? By this very point, a plan, a long-range plan that would be concomitant with a bond that would be presented to the people of the local bonds that pass are mostly because the local government really spells out what the money will be used for. We would accept that obligation on our part in the letting of the, uh, the proffering the bond to the people and then have with it the performance measures you speak of. It would seem that that would be easily enough done, would it not be? Uh, Mr. Nelson, that, that certainly is, is one way of exercising legislative oversight. Uh, certainly the legislature's budget appropriation authority is of its key ways of exercising oversights, but there are ways, there are ways of, of, of addressing, addressing that. It doesn't quite have the teeth, shall I say, but it's more facilitating of accomplishing the purpose of the bond, I think. There, there's a lot of ways to go about it, and one of, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at the different aspects. Again, triggering, potentially, projects before a new project is started with the continuous appropriation, the legislature knows. But the budget is a pretty strong tool for oversight. So at any point in time that those continuous appropriations don't work, pulling it back into the budget does seem to be a, a good option to leave on the table for the legislature. And okay. having, knowing who is administering those funds and, and who has oversight and what the public knows about those funds does seem to still um, ring true for our office. But you're right, taking a, a, a broader approach, the state has quite a bit of funding that's off budget um, that doesn't have too many problems. So we, you know, we want to be open to all of the ideas that can come forward. And I, I think we would all want to be that. I just say I've been personally through too many budgets. And I'm a bit of a cynic about that. 
Uh, but I would, would add maybe to the milestones, your plan, your accountability performance objectives and milestones. Uh, all major projects have milestones. Mm -hmm. Milestones can be guides. And there are ways the legislature can assert itself short of the budget. And, and I would suggest that approach be considered. Okay, any more comments, members? Let me just ask a few more. Sorry, while we have you here. You're the object of LAO, right? right. Okay. Let, let me uh, ask a question. You mentioned uh, one of your thought processes was the beginning of your presentation about be beneficiary pays. Mm -hmm. Let's go through that a bit more to okay. get the committee to understand when is a beneficiary a beneficiary, uh, ultimately. Uh, it, conveyance and associated mitigation, is that beneficiary pays to, to you folks? Or is it that a GO? In terms of conveyance, uh, two things. One, there's been a willingness to pay by the folks who benefit. Now, the conveyance itself, the direct beneficiaries should be those who are receiving the water. Uh, mitigation. Mitigation, by definition, is tied to the capital project and generally, in most practices, is paid for by the uh, beneficiary. It is still within the purview of the legislature to determine a lesser amount for the beneficiaries or to say we think that conveyance around the delta also benefits the state as a whole because of X. I can't give you what X is, but mm -hmm. yes, generally um, the beneficiaries do pay. Okay, so let's go piece by piece. So okay. Environmental restoration, is that a geo? That depends. Okay. Uh, that's the one that, that's the big one that depends. Uh, okay. It can be general obligation bonds. Mm -hmm. One can determine that um, the cause of harm to the, re the ecosystem was caused by a certain group or a series of groups. Then potentially, uh, this is the wrong word for it, but the, the term is the polluters pay. So those who cause the harm, you kind of want them to contribute. Now, again, do they need to contribute 100%? legislative prerogative, you can decide what the percentages are um, as you go forward. Okay, but that sounded like you drifted into mitigation for a moment. So I'm, I'm on pure restoration itself, how, how would... Well, yeah. let's talk about restoration maybe as a long term. In, sure. in the Delta, right. and I'll, I'll use the Delta as an example, mercury uh, mining from the 1800s caused some of the problems in the Delta. Getting those folks to pay up could be kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's the state as a whole that needs to uh, contribute okay. to that. Just getting, so you're possible. talking about watershed, conservation, recycling, some of these larger, broader. Some, some of the broader issues. Is a geo kind of a, within the geo realm? They, and they, as, the more complex they become, the more difficult it is to attribute okay. to one or okay. more individuals. So, so we've got conveyance, we've got associated mitigation tied to that is a beneficiary principle, kind of what I heard big picture. You have, uh, if you will, the environmental restoration in the UGO category. Let me ask you the hardest question given those. I didn't set you up on purpose, surface storage. I'm ready. So surface storage is beneficiary pays, GO bonds. I mean, give me your, your overall perspective on that particular category, because that's obviously we're one of the categories of contention. We've had a, a hard time determining who pays for surface storage. Generally, it should be the beneficiaries. However, again, who are the beneficiaries? When we first started looking at the Department of Water Resources analysis of sites reservoir, they had the reservoir as being both benefiting almost solely the drinking water users of Southern California of, uh, th that are with the state water project. So in that case, one would say, well, okay, uh, the beneficiaries should pay for it. However, the tune has changed. So now we're talking about a partial recreation facility, a partial hydroelectric facility, a facility that potentially has benefits for flood, for water, and, and I'm not the expert on whether any of these things are valid or not, but as they become larger and a, a larger part of the um, reservoir itself, uh, it could be that the beneficiaries, the direct beneficiaries of the project get smaller and smaller. And in that case, we do look at a larger general obligation bond if the project were to be deemed cost-benefit, um, valid, or otherwise. I'll give you a different example. 
Uh, Diamond Valley Reservoir in Southern California was built recently. It was built with ratepayer funds. They used a variety of financing mechanisms, pay as you go, uh, ratepayer funds, and bond funds. That was solely paid for by the beneficiaries of that project, which were uh, the users of the Metropolitan Water District. That's it. So there, there's no hard and fast rule to force you to do one or the other, and it's within your purview to decide mm -hmm. how how far we go. So this might fall in the realm of 50-50. A percentage could be determined. But okay. It would be good to have the amount that it would be good to have a determination of how much I don't necessarily mean to the split. I'm just saying that within your your <coughs> your response to that seems to be it could cut either way. It could cut either way. Okay. That's and right. to me, that might be a 50-50. It might be something different. Uh, community Mr. Chair, I yes. Think, I think the prosecution is leading the witness here. No. <laughs> I handed them the piece of paper before we started this. Oh, okay. Uh, community investment uh, watershed again. So these fall within, again, that larger category of geo, the, the traditional category of geo. When you say watershed, um, well, I'm talking I'm about some of the, our restoration, our long-term habitat, some of the, the bigger issues to the delta that we've been discussing. That, that, that isn't a beneficiary pays principle. Is it, that correct? It could be. It, it generally, unless there's a really strong nest, it's very hard to tie some of the watershed issues to one group. However, yeah. you can tie them to regional groups. Okay. And there could be a regional assessment. I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, there's a lot of different options, but regional assessment so l let's say something only uh, benefits the Lawson area, mm -hmm. Lawson National Park area, or, mm -hmm. or folks up there. Uh, you know, th having folks from San Diego pay for it could be a, a bit of a stretch. I see. But if it's deemed important to the state of California, it's within your purview to okay. go there. Uh, excuse yes. me, Senator. If I just may, probably just a couple things important to clarify. One is the application of the beneficiary pays principle. Um, could mean a 100% general fund geo bond. It's just that the beneficiaries are the, the state at large. So it's perhaps not beneficiary pays versus something else, but that's an, a, a guiding principle that, that just dicta dictates the role of, of public funding and, and private funding. So it's not sort of either, either or. But something I, that may be important to clarify is that you may have a, sing, a single expenditure or a single activity that has both public and private benefits from the same expenditure. And it, it's sort of a policy call for the legislature to, to allocate those benefits among the state at large and the, uh, um, and the direct beneficiaries. And just to give you just one example from, from history under CalFed is a program called the Environmental Water Account. And that is an account that uh, makes water supply deliveries more reliable to water users. So there's a, a direct private benefit, but also there are some fish and wildlife enhancements and, and benefits that benefit the public at large. So in, in that case, that would be you would have a single expenditure but you perhaps would want to divide the funding responsibility between the public at large and the, the direct beneficiaries. Okay, thank you. I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Senator Nielsen. If I may, this might be just one place to interject something. This lengthy and beneficial discussion of beneficiaries is entirely appropriate, but I would like to suggest that it's one of the reasons that I believe it's very important to consider in our language, area of origin protections. One of the alarming provisions of one of the proposals here in the terms of the authorities of the Stewardship Council is that those rights could be compromised. And, and that is not a beneficiary issue, that is a detriment, that's a bit of a taking. And I believe that, uh, and I would argue in our deliberations and in our final product, that the affirmation of those area of origin rights are going to be very, very important. Thank you. Um, S Senator Nielsen. Uh, if we could go on to the presentation of the finance proposals, that's next on our, our agenda. And Senator Cogdell, would you like to begin and bring uh, anyone you want, uh, proponents and others uh, with you? That would be great. And then we will uh, turn over uh, the microphone to Assemblywoman Caballero, and she'll make a presentation. And then Senator Semidian should be joining us uh, sometime. Yes, Senator Anstad. Just, just to 
just some thought, thoughts on the whole financing. I mean, th I think it's very clear to everybody who's listened to the last hour and a half that uh, we could spend 10 years debating who finances what, and that's why projects don't get done. And maybe we should think outside the box and think in terms of uh, the state highway patrol. You know, the fact of the matter is, is they're in every community in the state. They have facilities in some communities and not in others, but overall, they serve the function of everybody in the state for a purpose. And maybe we should start thinking in terms of the state water system getting away from the archaic system of who pays for what and just stipulate as a legislature that this is now in the year 2009 become a general obligation of every resident of the state. Thank you, Senator Astaff. Uh Senator Congo. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation to this uh, committee. I uh, wanted to give you just kind of a brief reminder, timeline, if you will, of, of where we have been as it relates to our proposal on uh, uh, water bond uh, for several years now. Started again with SB 59 back in 2007, if you remember, that was the governor's water bond. That evolved into AB 9 double X during the special session that we had on water. We joined together with Assembly Member Plesha at that time. And then uh, the further evolution, which uh, represents our current bond that's in print, SB 371, that we introduced earlier this year. This current proposal that I'm going to present today uh, is in language that we've gotten back now from the uh, Ledge Council's office and has been, I know, widely disseminated. And what we wanted to do is uh, really try to come together in one document and incorporate the issues of governance, Delta Plan, and the other things that we've been talking about relating to uh, the overall water needs of the state of California. So we have uh, created a, a document that really reflects amendments to uh, SB 371 that would, we believe, do all of that, those things. Um, SB 371 is based primarily on the language that was supported by Senator Feinstein and Governor Schwarzenegger, again, another uh, evolution from where we originally started. And uh, the current proposal updates the provisions of 371 and includes the governance proposal, as I mentioned, in, all in one bill. The bond provisions themselves, uh, the bond is titled the Safe, Clean, Reliable Drinking Water Supply Act of, two, of 2010, and it's now uh, has a dollar amount totaling $12.395 billion. Uh, our proposal is to put the question before the voters in November of 2010. There are 14 chapters in the bill. I'm not going to go through all of those, but there are uh, significant issues under a number of the chapters that I do want to highlight and then certainly leave as much time as we can uh, for questions. Chapter 4 is the general provisions and what's important about this chapter is it clearly states that public dollars are for public benefit, back to what you were talking about earlier. It includes most of the recently negotiated language on area of origin, back to Senator Nielsen's question concerning the need to do that and this has been a major uh, sticking point for some time uh, and the language that's in our proposal now reflects a lot of work that's, that's gone into that effort and a consensus among the Northern California Water Agencies that uh, they feel, from what I understand, adequately protects them. Chapter 5 creates a safe, clean, reliable drinking water supply fund itself. Again, we talked about how this mechanism would work in our proposal, the bond money would go into that fund and then be dispersed uh, from that. Chapter 6 is a water supply reliability uh, section. It's uh, $2.325 billion of the total. $1.7 billion is set aside for grants for regional projects that are consistent with an integrated or an integration regional water management plan. Uh, this money, in order to access it, requires a 25 percent local share. Uh, and the monies are allocated according to hydrological regions. Those are all spelled out uh, in the, uh, the language. $500 million is called for under this section for local and regional conveyance projects, and uh, those require a 50 percent local cost share. There's $125 million set aside for local and regional drought relief projects, and again, those require a 50 percent local share in order to access that money. Chapter 7 is Delta Conveyance, or rather Delta Governance chapter. This is a new chapter that's been added, uh, again, to deal with the issue of, of governance. Um, 
and uh, the findings uh, and uh, declarations uh, are spelled out that, uh, again, stress the importance of the co-equal goals uh, and uh, what we believe obviously needs to be the co-equal nature of those. There are several articles in that chapter, and again, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to highlight the, the, those that are the most important. Article 4 deals with the missions and duties, powers and responsibilities of the Council. Under our proposal, the Council would consist of seven members appointed by the Governor. Uh, this requires the Council members to have a wide range of experience rather than, than uh, different categories um, identified for different spots. We have basically put in a very broad um, uh, qualification that is required uh, for each member to meet before they could um, be um, appointed. The only salaried position under our proposal would be the Executive Director of the Council and otherwise the Council has uh, to utilize staff from Resources Agency uh, and the Department. There is no hiring authority given to the Council or its Executive Director under our proposal. CalFed Bay Delta program and staff, uh, again under our uh, language, would be transferred to this new Council that would be created. Council is tasked with preparing and adopting a Delta plan and um, it uh, does not pre-approve project projects. It only has an appellate uh, authority. Article 5 is, uh, spells out the Delta Science Board. Uh, under our proposal, we call for 12 members appointed by the Council and uh, these folks are intended to provide the expertise on ecosystem and water management and this board would replace the existing CalFed Independent Science Board. Article 6 is the Delta Plan section of, of our proposal and uh, it calls for the uh, Council to prepare, adopt and review uh, and uh, possibly revise the Delta Plan. Prior to the adoption of the plan, the Council can advise local and state agencies. Uh, authority stops, however, at an advisory role. The goal of the plan is to achieve again, the co-equal goals that we've all uh, set out. Geographic scope is limited to the Delta and the uh, Sassoon Marsh and uh, the Delta Vision Guideline drafting document uh, is part of the, uh, the, the Delta plan uh, as it uh, is primarily used again as a guiding document in that, in that process. Council required uh, to consult the Delta counties prior to adopting the plan, something that we think is very important. Article 7 uh, deals with the Bay Delta Conservation Plan and under our proposal, the Council adopts the BDCP as part of the Delta Plan as long as it meets an appropriate conservation standard. Uh, and in our proposal, we're talking about what has commonly been referred to as the gold standard or the NCCP. Um, Council may hear an appeal on BDCP's attainment uh, of those conservation standards and um, uh, the BDCP under our proposal is eligible for state funds. We think that's important because if you're going to again hold uh, them to the requirement of the high standard that we've put in our uh, bill, it's going to require resources to do that. Uh, Article 8 deals with state and local agencies um, and uh, their interaction uh, for projects in the Delta each agency self-certifies uh, their consistency with the plan and the Council provides guidelines to assist agencies in preparing self-certification documentation. Uh, Article 9 uh, deals with the appeals process and how that would work again under our proposal. Appeals to the Council on uh, consistency of the plan must be made within 30 days of self-certification. Uh, and I think it's appropriate here to point out that our goal in all of this is to make sure that all of the safeguards are taken into consideration and adequately addressed, but that they're done so in a timely manner so that projects can move forward uh, as they are uh, planned. Council can reject an appeal or hear it. If they hear it, they must do so within 60 days of that appeal being filed. And after hearing the appeal, the Council can make findings uh, and uh, remand the project back to the responsible agency if uh, the consistency is not, has not been achieved in the opinion of the Council. Decisions of the Council uh, will have expedited judicial review under our proposal, uh, meaning straight to the Supreme Court. Again, the goal being to cut through the appellate process and, and get the decision made as quickly as possible. Article 10 deals with federal agencies um, and uh, the Council 
uh, has to come up with a plan for coordinating their activities with the federal agencies involved with the Delta. Article 11 is Delta Protection Commission. Uh, the DPC's land use and resource management plan is required to be consistent with the Delta plan. Article 12 deals with state water operations and requires the council to conduct a study in cooperation with DWR to determine if it is feasible to establish the state water project as an independent public agency. This is something that many of us have talked about for some time. Uh, chapter 8 deals with Delta sustainability. Um, funding for the public benefit uh, projects to assist in uh, the Delta sustainability is a vital res for the, the vital resource of fish, wildlife, water quality, water supply, agriculture, and recreation. In this section of our um, bill, we allocate $3 billion, which would be continuously appropriated, appropriated to the council to, um, uh, for project uh, uh, that uh, improved Delta sustainability. The funding can be used to achieve conservation standards that have been spelled out in the uh, BDCP under our proposal. Chapter 9 is the statewide water system operation uh, improvement section of uh, our bond. $4 billion uh, is allocated in this section and it's continuously appropriated to the California Water Commission for public benefit portions of the project. Uh, eligible projects would be CalFed projects, groundwater storage, conjunctive use and reservoir reoperation, regional and local surface storage projects. The projects must meet measurable improvements, uh, or must provide rather, uh, measurable improvements to the Delta, and the public benefits eligible for, fun for funding under our proposal include ecosystem, water quality, flood control, emergency response, and recreation. 75% of the non-public benefit funding has to be committed before the bonds are issued. Um, it's a requirement under our proposal that um, in order to access any of this public benefit money, uh, the beneficiaries, if you will, 75% of them have to have stepped forward and signed on the dotted line, committing themselves to the issuance of revenue bonds or whatever uh, sources they may have to provide the total funding for the projects. And we, based on current cost estimates, estimate that um, of the three projects that have been referred to most often, again, going back to CalFed, and, and we've all talked about them often, you're looking at probably a total of about $8 billion in costs. So it goes back to some of the discussions we had about the percentages relating to uh, public benefit. Um, chapter 10 uh, is the chapter that deals with conservation and watershed protection. Uh, in this chapter, there's $1.5 billion that's been allocated uh, upon appropriation by the legislature for ecosystem and watershed protection and restoration projects. $85 million for invasive species, primarily the uh, quagga mussel. $200 million to Coastal Conservancy. $100 million to Wildlife Conservancy Board for the benefit of migratory birds. And $200 million to Wildlife Conservancy Board for listed species. $50 million for uh, salmonid passage in the Sacramento River, $190 million to Cal Fire for fuel reduction to protect watershed from the impact of forest fires. This is something we think is very important as we look at uh, not only the issues concerning healthy forests, but certainly as it relates to our watershed. We all know that the latter fuels that there are there and are there in abundance uh, suck up an awful lot of water that could be ultimately uh, moving on down through the, the drainage and, and uh, benefiting um, certainly the, uh, the, the co-equal goals. $260 million for dam removal on the Klamath. Uh, most of you, I think, are aware of the settlement that has been reached that calls for the state of California and the state of o Oregon to participate in the removal of a number of small dams on the Klamath River. Uh, this section of our bond would provide the resources for California to participate that in that and get that uh, important project uh, taken care of. Chapter 11 is the groundwater protection and water quality portion of our proposal. This is $1.05 billion, uh, again, upon appropriation by the legislature, and it's broke out as follows. $360 million to prevent or reduce groundwater contamination, $100 million of it for disadvantaged communities and economically distressed areas, $90 million to the Department of Public Health for emergency drinking water supplies in disadvantaged communities, 
$200 million for small community wastewater treatment projects, $300 million to State Water Resources Control Board for stormwater management projects, and $100 million to the Ocean Protection Fund. Chapter 12 is a water recycling and advanced uh, treatment uh, technology section where we've allocated $500 million uh, for that purpose. Chapter 13 deals with water use efficiency programs and it's a $20 million allocation there. So that pretty much sums up uh, how the, uh, the bond uh, or our proposal uh, lays out relating to the amounts of money and how they're allocated and again our idea how to appropriately move forward on the issue of governance in the Delta. Members, there are questions for Senator Cogdell? Senator, I have a, just a, one question, a couple of questions on, on, on the concept. Uh, you uh, obviously have been a, a champion for storage. Right. Uh, and, and, and I'm wondering if I could get your, your overall impressions of your bill within the context between the balance of conveyance and storage. In other words, what would come first? Where would storage fall in? And how do you see that playing in in terms of your financing mechanism within the bill? Well, again, uh, they're, they're, uh, in fact, it's, ex it's, uh, it's stated in our um, proposal that none of these monies can be used for the construction of conveyance, as was discussed earlier by the LAO. Um, the, the construction cost for that uh, infrastructure is, is something that is, uh, uh, you know, will be handled by the beneficiaries exclusively. And what we've been talking about, again, with this bond, uh, is public benefit portions. Um, of the uh, expenditures in the, pro in the projects that we have uh, set forward. So there, are, there again, aren't any monies uh, allocated from this bond for the construction of um, a canal around, through, over, under, whatever, uh, the delta. But there are monies there, as I spelled out, for improved conveyance uh, projects on a local basis uh, that, again, will achieve or uh, contribute to the co-equal goals. Senator Pavley. Um, regarding your three projects, I assume those were storage projects. You had about four billion in the bond, correct? And it cost yes. eight billion. Is that essentially yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, the cost projections, the most recent ones that we have, I think, total again on the three projects, which were um, Sites Reservoir, uh, Temperance Flat, and uh, the uh, raising of Los Vaqueros, totaled about eight billion dollars, I recall. What is the benefit to the private sector or agencies or community versus the public benefit? Well, the public benefit, again, in our bond uh, or in our proposal, there's criteria spelled out uh, that a project would have to meet in order to be eligible for any of the uh, uh, public benefit uh, money. So that would be determined at that time, and, and whatever that dollar amount totaled uh, would be what they would be eligible for. Who, who makes that determination? Um, I think it's uh, the, yeah, the Water Commission, the Construction Commission. Okay. Ms. Fuller. Can you, can you explain how your bill balances the co-equal goals and provides us with reliable water just as an overview. I know you've been working many, many years to bring to this point and I'd just like to have your thinking and your little bit of definition of terms on, on why this bill is well balanced for our state's total comprehensive needs. Um, again, as you, if, if you, uh, you know, total up the numbers, the, the, the parts that go primarily for uh, brick and mortar infrastructure, if you will, um, Arguably, I think probably range somewhere in uh, between four and five billion dollars, and that includes the monies that's available for uh, local projects uh, along those lines. And the remainder of the 12.4 roughly billion dollars, I would argue, uh, go primarily for ecosystem uh, restoration projects or, or um, purposes that will um, certainly address that goal specifically versus the uh, reliable water supply. Goal. So I think it's, you know, it's not 50-50, but I do believe it's balanced, uh, again, as, as we have uh, worked now for all these years to, to lay out what we felt was a comprehensive solution, taking into consideration the work that's been done by DWR, 
Delta Vision and others uh, relating to the needs that are out there. We've tried to put dollar amounts to that uh, in what we believe to be appropriate amounts to meet those goals. Okay. Members, any other questions? Senator Cargo, you and I share a portion of the district, so let me, uh, I spend more time in Bakersfield than, than uh, Fresno, and, 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 and there is a quite a bit of below ground storage uh, in the lower part, as you know, in, in the district, uh, semi-tropic and right. some of the current, current water bank. Does your bond speak to, or what is your thoughts on the additional capacity that's already available uh, somewhere, some have said uh, nearly a million acre feet uh, below ground. And does that, how do we fill those aquifers as we are, are readying for the additional storage that, that you're pushing for in your bond? How do we weigh both of those would be my question. Well, again, I think through the, uh, the monies that we've set aside in the water reliability uh, section uh, of the bond um, and uh, some of the other areas, uh, the goal would be certainly to be able to enhance existing systems and to uh, create hopefully more opportunity to uh, certainly in wet years uh, direct more water into those uh, aquifers. It's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we have argued that uh, a lot of uh, this work, if it were done over time, we could uh, deal effectively with a lot of the current groundwater problems we have, the overdraft situation, et cetera, by obviously being able to Put more, money, put more water into those aquifers during wet years and, and hopefully solve that problem to the point where maybe we wouldn't have to establish a whole new level of bureaucracy and regulation relating to groundwater. Uh, uh, Assemblymember Solario and then uh, Assemblyman Huffman. Thank you. First, I want to thank you, Senator, for putting this uh, package together. Every year, uh, you know, you, you fine tune the proposal and uh, uh, gets more comprehensive. The, the one uh, different element this year from uh, prior versions is you have a lot of the governance elements, uh, other things that, you know, maybe in some ways are covered and the other policy bills we're looking at. Can you talk a little bit about why um, this time for this bond proposal you have that approach in there? Oh, certainly. As you know, over the last few years, uh, the whole issue with uh, uh, the health of the Delta and the need to address um, that very important uh, issue has become more and more critical and certainly the governor's recognized it and the work that he's done and the uh, setting up the Blue Ribbon Commission and then, and then the, uh, the good work that they did with the, the Delta Vision and what has come out of that and we wanted to be certainly responsive to that uh, and, and prepare a proposal that would, in our opinion, uh, meld with that new governance in an effective way, uh, again to uh, address and meet the go the co-equal goals and so that's what's different about our proposal uh, at this point uh, we have tried to come forward uh, in this document with our ideas relating to how best to move forward on new governance in the delta and again to deal with the uh, the bdcp process and the ultimate uh, plan in the delta um, and you know it's uh, it, we really are are here to put it on the table so that we have uh, a bookend, if you will, a proposal to to uh, use as we move forward in negotiations. But we think uh, at this point that it presents um, the most effective uh, and best way to move forward again without creating whole new levels of bureaucracy that will obviously be, be very expensive to maintain over time and we're concerned would not be all that effective and again meeting the co-equal goals. Okay. Chapman. Thank you. Senator Cogdell, I want to... Um, also commend you for your hard work on this and, and in particular on your uh, willingness to be creative. I think we've seen an evolution in your uh, proposals uh, to this bond issue and uh, I've seen more and more uh, broad public benefits reflected in some of the funding priorities. I've seen uh, good ecosystem priorities begin to emerge, um, Klamath uh, River restoration items like that. I happen to be one who uh, believes that uh, we are going to have to do a bond to meet some of our resource protection goals and obligations uh, as soon as we possibly can. The, the, the Klamath Dam removal is one of many, many examples. The Delta ecosystem goals we've set for ourselves, that's going to require some bond money. So I, I think we do need to have this discussion. But I wanted to ask you kind of about the here and now challenge of a general obligation bond right. uh, because we all know that our uh, the, the issue of needing to do it and the issue of when to do it, uh, you know, may be different 
issues. And we all know that our credit rating right now is hovering just above junk bond status. I'm not even sure that we have access to the kind of uh, bonds that would be sold uh, under this proposal. And we also know that our general fund is upside down and that a uh, geo bond in the range of 10 billion dollars, uh, when last we looked at it, was going to put about 800 million dollars of new debt service on the general fund. That was when we had a much better credit rating than we do today. So presumably that debt service burden is even higher today. And of course, since the last time we looked at it, um, we have uh, we have experienced a great deal of, of pain and cuts and some, some critical funding priorities. So I wanted to put the question to you, what is your answer? Yeah to those who point to uh, our credit rating, who point to the high cost of borrowing uh, in this current fiscal uh, situation for the state, and also um, to the fact that right now, we really don't have an answer for how we would pay for that debt service. Right. Again, all of those points you make are, are very valid as it relates certainly to the here and now. I don't think anybody can argue uh, with that. Um, under our proposal, the question would not be put before the voters until November of 2010. And as we discussed with the LAO earlier, um, and as we all, I think, are well aware, these projects are not going to be built overnight. In fact, we're probably looking at a decade, maybe up to two decades, before the projects would actually be built. There um, is a lot of debt that we have out now uh, that will be, uh, as was um, uh, indicated again by the LAO, retired over the next 10, 15 years. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I think that uh, if, if the political campaign revolves around the assumption that we're going to go out and issue whatever the amount of money in, in bonds and start making those payments in next year's, out of next year's general fund, then it's going to be a challenge, obviously. Uh, but the truth is something different than that. And I think that, uh, again, as we look at the role of the legislature in all of this, it's, it's incumbent on us to set the priorities on, on how we're going to move forward with a lot of the bonded debt that's already been approved. That is still our call as to when we issue uh, that debt and for what purposes. And I'm one that believes that there isn't a higher priority for this state than water. Um, I certainly agree with the comments that have been made about pay as you go. And uh, I wish we had that ability. I wish we had uh, in our budgeting uh, a capital improvement line item, if you will, that we put money into. Uh, each and every year and dedicated it for that purpose and no matter what was happening uh, with our other uh, uh, needs in the general fund, we didn't touch it. Uh, if we did that, obviously, we wouldn't need to borrow money. Nobody, uh, I don't believe, is, is uh, enamored with that uh, aspect and the costs involved. But there again, these are for major capital improvements. Historically, that's how we've done it. We have to be responsible about it and if we are fortunate to get a financing package along with all of these other questions out of this legislature and before the people. I think it's going to be incumbent on all of us to make the appropriate arguments to hopefully convince them that we've come up with the right plan and a way to move forward. Uh, and I certainly hope that the budget situation gets a lot better within the next five years and our bond rating gets back where it needs to be and all those yeah. things. And I think a lot of the things that have happened over the last year in our budgets uh, will set us up to do that. I think okay. we've made some adjustments that needed to be made. So. so, Senator, do I understand you to say that um, you think that the debt service hit to the general fund will take place over time and not all at once? And uh, do, you, do you suggest any specific way of funding that debt service, or do you just think it can be absorbed in the state budget as we go? Well, again, I think we're, we're back to this argument over uh, public benefit versus private benefit. And uh, again, we believe there are significant public benefits to this, uh, to these uh, items of infrastructure that we're talking about building, uh, and that uh, we put in our proposal a process to determine that, uh, and a way to go about putting a dollar amount on that as it relates to what the different projects are eligible to achieve or to receive um, in this portion of, of funding. But the remainder of that, again, is the responsibility of the beneficiaries, and uh, to the point where they have to step up and commit themselves mm -hmm. uh, and prove that they're capable of, of providing the, uh, you know, half or so or maybe more of the resources necessary to actually build the improvements. Could we talk about uh, storage, the storage piece specifically? I, I don't know if there's anything new in, in your bond since last uh, you and I talked about it in, in our working group. Uh, and I apologize if there is and I missed that part of your presentation. but. Um, 
as I understand it, uh, you've sort of embraced the idea that there would be a dedicated uh, chapter in the bond for storage that would include both surface and groundwater storage, uh, and that there would be a competition uh, based on enumerated factors for that funding. Is that still the case? Uh, it is the uh, the case. Um, it, you know, our in the, the the bond that's actually in print, the bill SB three seventy one. It was Chapter eight that mm -hmm. dealt with all of that. In our new proposal, it's now Chapter nine. And just to, to uh, um, go over those items quickly again, um, or rather, that's let me see. Yeah, it's, I got the article here in just a second. Uh, it's now $4 billion to be appropriated uh, to the California Water Commission, which is our form of construction commission. And the eligible projects would be the CalFed projects, groundwater storage, conjunctive use, and reservoir reoperation, mm -hmm. and regional and local uh, surface storage projects. Um, and the public benefits uh, are eligible for funding ecosystem. Uh, issues, water control, uh, quality, flood control, emergency response, and under our proposal, recreation. Okay. So the emergency response and recreation have been added since, yeah. Probably, yeah. So, um, they were always, I think they were always in there. It's always been a bone of contention. I remember. Yeah, they were always there. <laughs> um, is it conceivable, Senator, that in a, a competitive process where you've got groundwater storage projects and reservoir reoperation projects and proposed new surface storage projects that, um, based on the criteria you've enumerated, projects other than new surface storage might win out? Or is it um, hardwired into that that uh, you're going to have at least one of the major surface storage projects getting that funding? I don't think it's it's necessarily hardwired. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a criteria that has to be met, and um, as we know, things t change over time. So, um, again, we haven't specifically spelled out any uh, right. particular project, and so from that standpoint, I wouldn't say it's necessarily hardwired. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Senator Nielsen. If I may, I Assemblyman Huffman did raise a very profound concern about bonded indebtedness and the obligations of the state of California. And I've kind of been fussing with this over time, particularly the course of last year when the bond proposal for speed rail was being considered, $7 billion. I'll not argue the merits of that project, but the voters of California clearly supported it. That's $7 billion. In the long run, that will at best serve the many hundreds of thousands or maybe even the lower millions of Californians. What we're talking about here, water, is for the billions and for the generations. I would argue this is a huge priority. And as we've discussed before, this state has not taken any significant action on infrastructure on water since the 60s, whereas we have for all the major other, particularly transportation, priorities. I would believe that people of California are amenable to us moving ahead in this area with some bonded indebtedness, and it's critical that we do so. We would agree. Okay. Any other comments, members? Okay. Senator Cargo, thank you. Assemblywoman Cap Caballero, she was here a moment ago. Would that uh, Senator Simidians, Alan, would you like to, you want to wait, call him? <laughs> Members, we have uh, two authors that we're waiting to hear from. Uh, maybe we can take a 10 minute break till five o'clock, a little stretching break, and then we'll come back and hear from either Assemblywoman Caballero or from Senator Simidian. <laughs> 